Now we've completed our introduction to the general ideas behind resonance. We have a kind of basic idea of what resonance is, and we also have a basic idea of why we're interested in drawing the resonance structures. Remember, the purpose of drawing the resonance structures is to identify where the charges are in the molecule. Now we have to get into the nitty gritty of actually correctly drawing resonance structures. That's the key skill that we hope to get from this series of videos, how to quickly and efficiently and correctly draw resonance structures. Now what we're going to start by doing is we're going to start by learning how to draw a resonance structure when you're already given the electron pushing arrows. So I'm going to give you some situations where I'm going to give you the electron pushing arrows and you just have to draw the resonance structure that's based on that. Now, um, in real life, that's a very rare situation. In real life, you're not going to be given the electron pushing arrows. You have to come up with them on your own. Um, but it's pointless to learn about how to come up with the electron pushing arrows on your own until you understand how to work with the electron pushing arrows. So it's very important to go through this section of the videos and learn how to interpret the electron pushing arrows. Only if you're very clear about how to interpret electron pushing arrows that you're given by somebody else, only then can you start coming up with the electron pushing arrows yourself. So I hope that this part of the videos will be quite helpful to you, even though this is a skill that you're not actually going to be tested directly on. Since we're going to be learning how to work with electron pushing arrows, it's important to be very clear about what the terminology is for electron pushing arrows. So here's what an electron pushing arrow looks like. These are also called curved arrows. Curved arrows for obvious reasons, because they're usually drawn as curves. Well, it's important to realize that every curved, arrows have, every curved arrow has two parts. It has a head and it has a tail. It might seem obvious or trivial, but it's important to be clear that there's two parts of the arrow the head or the tail. So we've got to know how to interpret the head and we've got to know how to interpret the tail. Um, so those are terms I'm going to use a lot in these videos, the head of the arrow and the tail of the arrow. I find that sometimes people just get confused about what the head of the arrow is and what the tail of the arrow is. So um, point to the head of this arrow. This is the head. This is the head of the arrow. Now point to the tail. This is the tail. So make sure you're clear in your mind that when I'm referring to the tail of the arrow, this end is the tail. And when I refer to the head, this end of the arrow is the head. What's the difference between those two parts? Well, remember that the electron pushing arrow tells you where the electrons are coming from and where the electrons are going to. The arrow tells us where the electrons are coming from and where the electrons are going to. The tail of the arrow shows us where the electrons are coming from. And the head of the arrow shows us where the electrons are going to. So you can see how crucial it is not to get confused about which end is the head and which end is the tail. Um, if you started thinking that this end was the, head, was the head, then you'd be totally reversing the direction in which the, air, in which the electrons were moving. So please be clear in your mind that this is the tail where the electrons are coming from, and this is the head where the electrons are going to. Try drawing uh, the resonance structure that follows from this electron pushing arrow. I hope you gave that a shot. Let's go through that together. Remember, we use a double-headed arrow to indicate that we're drawing another resonance structure. All right now, I'm going to introduce a really useful technique in organic chemistry. This is the redraw and modify technique. We're going to use the redraw and modify technique. The first thing we're going to do is redraw our original picture. Notice that I've simply redrawn the original picture. I haven't made any changes. So obviously this is not the correct resonance structure, it's just our starting point. Now we're going to start modifying it. Well, let's start with the tail of the arrow. Where are the electrons coming from? Well, the tail of this arrow is on the lone pair. Uh, that means the electrons are coming from the lone pair. That means we have to erase the lone pair. That's not going to be there anymore. And now let's immediately deal with the charges. This atom is losing its lone pair. That means it must be coming more positive. So let's put a positive charge on this nitrogen. Now, where are those electrons going to? Well, they're going to where the head of the arrow is. Notice that the head of this arrow is in the middle of the sigma bond. The convention is that when the head of the arrow is in the middle of a sigma bond, that indicates that you're forming a pi bond. When the head of the arrow is in the middle of a sigma bond, that indicates you're forming a pi bond. 
So the electrons that used to be in the lone pair have moved into this pi bond. So who gained the electrons here? Well, this arrowhead here was pointing towards this atom on the right. Now, this atom started off positive, but it's gaining electrons. If you start off positive and you gain electrons, you should become less positive. So this atom now has a zero formal charge. And now I can erase this arrow because I've accomplished all the moves that that arrow was telling us to do. So this is the correct resonance structure. So the move that we just learned how to do is moving a lone pair into a pi bond. We moved a lone pair into a pi bond. How did we know that we were moving a lone pair? Because the tail of the arrow was on the lone pair. And how did we know that we were moving it into a pi bond? Because the head of the arrow was in the middle of the sigma bond. This is just a convention that you need to make a flashcard of and memorize. When the head of the arrow is in the middle of a sigma bond, that indicates that we're forming a pi bond. I think that's a, a pretty intuitive convention, actually. Now, uh, remember that as soon as we erased this lone pair, we also said, well, now that this nitrogen has lost electrons, it must have become more positive. And as soon as we made the pi bond, we said, well, this atom has gained electrons, so it must have become less positive. Notice that this nitrogen started off neutral, so when it became more positive, it had a formal positive charge. But this carbon started with a positive charge. So when it gained electrons, it didn't become negative, it just became neutral. Notice again that if you start with a positive charge and you gain electrons, you just become one step more uh, less, you become one step less positive, which makes you neutral. So whenever we are moving the electrons around in electron pushing, we always only move um, in units of one step. So for example, we can go from a zero charge to a positive charge or we can go from a positive charge to a zero charge. You would never go from a positive charge to a negative charge. That's too big of a leap. You would never go from a positive charge to a negative charge. That's too big of a leap. Instead, you just go from neutral to positive, or from positive, say, to neutral. Uh, I think one mistake that it might be easy to make here is it might be easy to think that this lone pair was going to turn into a lone pair on this atom. It might be easy to erase this lone pair and make a lone pair over here. Well, how do we know that we shouldn't do that? Well, first of all, we know that we shouldn't do that because the head of this arrow is not on this carbon. Instead, it's in the middle of the sigma bond. We know that when the head of the arrow is in the middle of a sigma bond, it doesn't mean that you're indicating a lone pair. It means that you're indicating a pi bond, that you're making a pi bond. Um, but there's a more important reason, which is that um, when you're drawing resonance structures, you never move a lone pair into another lone pair. You never take a lone pair on one atom and turn it into a lone pair on another atom. That's just never done. So it would never be correct. It would never be correct to take this lone pair from the nitrogen and just transfer it onto this carbon over here. You can't take a lone pair from one place and transfer it all the way to someplace else. That's too big of a jump. That doesn't work in resonance. 